Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to everyone that's on here and especially online who's worshiping with us. I just want to say thank you for uh, our guests and visitors who has come um, in person and also online. So welcome to our church and hopefully today you will be blessed by our Lord because I know you will be blessed because our God is here within our midst. So I am going to start with... Uh, the call to worship, it can be found in SDA hymnals number 845, or you can also turn to your Bible to Psalms 29, 1 to 2. And it reads, Give unto the Lord, all you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Now as thou bow our head for our prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much for letting us be here to gather and to worship your name, Lord God. I pray that the Holy Spirit will be in each one of us to receive your words, and I pray that we continue to give glory and honor to you, and may the joy of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, dear Lord. Forgive us for our, all our iniquities, for what wrongs we have done, and just like we heard earlier, dear Lord, you are great and wonderful to forgive it, dear God. May we confess everything to you and give it all to you. And may we have a gloryful Sabbath day today to be with you and to fellowship with one another. In Jesus I pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I'm here at church and online to those people who are tuning in today. And I wish everyone had a wonderful week. And for our first song, we will sing, sing a new song to the Lord, SDA hymnal number 33. song it'll be trust and obey hymn number five, hymn number 590 
And for our opening song this morning, we shall sing Morning Has Broken, SDA Hymnal number 44. Shall we all stand, please? Father, we are so thankful to be in your sanctuary this morning. And as in the sanctuary of old, we are pleading and we are praying for your spirit to be present with us here in this building, in this church, but also with anyone that's watching online. Please send your Holy Spirit to abide with us and in us today. We are thankful that you have supported and sustained us throughout this week to bring us to your blessed Sabbath day so that we could find peace and rest and healing. Please help us to enjoy the Sabbath for what it reminds us of, creation and redemption. And most importantly, through every part of our service, whether it is the prayers, the singing, or the Bible study, that we would see your son Jesus and grow closer to him and become more like him. This is our prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Hi. Happy Sabbath. And also good morning to our viewers in YouTube and Facebook Live. Thank you for joining with us this morning for our Sabbath, uh, Sabbath worship. For our reading for our tithes offering is entitled, William Tyndale Puts God First. Mm. Our first reading today centers on William Tyndale. If you do not remember who or never heard of him, we will be glad to learn more of him today. William Tyndale lost everything when he put God first. Even then, he didn't give up. In the 16th century, the Roman Catholic Church had prohibited the Bible from being read and understood by a regular people. Persecution was certain for anyone who challenged the authority of the church and especially the Pope. The papacy had become the apocalyptic beast depicted in the Bible. During this dark per period of human experience, William Tyndale was a light that helped change the course of human history by making the Bible accessible in English. Tyndale's translation was the first English Bible to draw directly from Hebrew and Greek text. It was also the first English translation to take advantage of the printing press, the latest technology at the time of spreading the message. 
This brought him into direct conflict with the church, which believed that the general population didn't have the skills to understand the church to do it for them. Sadly, in 1535, Tyndall was arrested and jailed. He was convicted of her say and executed and burned. His dying prayer was that the king of England's eyes would be opened. His prayers were answered not long after he gave his life for putting God first. The King James Bible would be compiled, sanctioned by the king of England. The Bible is the foundation of Western society, and Tyndall truly helped change the world by bringing the inspired text to the average person who could now understand it. We are called to help people understand the Bible so they can find freedom, healing, and hope in Jesus. We are faithful with our tithes and offerings. We are helping to, the, to take the three angels' messages to the entire world as God commanded. Putting God first by sponsoring missions are crucial. However, we should also invest our time and energy with the people around us, inspiring them to know more about the love of God. William Tyndale put God first, even when it cost him everything. He courage inspires our lives today, but there is even greater sacrifice. Jesus gave up everything to redeem us and his love compel us to put his kingdom first in our lives. Each day we are challenged to put God first in all that we do. Let us give back to the Lord what is his through our tithes and offerings. And we have two couples of ways where to send your tithes and offerings. Of course, if you want through mail, you can post in your check, pay to Las Vegas Film SDA Church, and mail it to Las Vegas Film Treasury P.O. Box 97676, Las Vegas, Nevada 89193. Or you may go to AdventistGiving.org. And when you hit the landing page of AdventistGiving.org, you may type the church, the Las Vegas Film SDA Church. I suggest so that it would be more easy for you guys, you can upload through Android and iPhone, the Adventist giving app. So it would be more easy access. It's just one click of a, in your fingertip and you would be there. And for our sanctuary, I request the deacons to please stand and collect our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Our most kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this Sabbath day that we could be able to worship and honor you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that we receive throughout the week, especially the health. Health is wealth, Lord. Thank you so much for that, that we are well and happy 
and bless this morning. And we return our tithes and offerings, Lord. Thank you so much for the many blessings that you bestowed upon us. And bless this offerings, Lord, that we receive today. And bless all the people, Lord, that who give their tithes and offering that they returned it to you. Continue to bless us, Lord, so that we can be able to give more. And thank you so much for everything, Lord, that you have done. We are so thankful and grateful for everything, Lord. And thank you so much for your love and care and for always being there for us. And be with us today, Lord, as we worship you. May the Holy Spirit be in the midst of us so that we can feel your presence this morning. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Today I'll be singing a song, When Life Gets Broken. I hope you'll be blessed by the message of this song.
Thank you, Kian, for that song. Can we say uh, one more amen for the special music? Amen. It was a blessing. I hope to hear you and, uh, and uh, Joven sing again. I love when you guys sing together. That is beautiful. Oh, thank you, Elder Gary. All right. So I'm going to switch to this mic testing. Give them a sec. Oh, there you go. Can everyone hear me? If you can hear me, say amen. All right. Elder Gary knows that I like to use the handheld mic because I like to move around a little bit. So I'm just going to, I'll probably turn this one down. Philan family, I am really, really excited and happy this morning. Um, of course, because it is the Sabbath and we get to fellowship together, but also because I've uh, met and seen a lot of new faces this morning. There is a Bob, good to have you here. Jack, they're in the, oh, not Jack, excuse, oh, yeah, Jack right over here. Hey, Jack. And uh, Gary, good to see you. Um, and also, uh, I, I, these are some new faces. I, there are some familiar faces here that I haven't seen in a little bit. My friends Gabby and Ricky, they're over there. Hello, hello. Um, Gabby went to Souls West with myself and my wife, uh, the Bible college that we were at um, more than a couple years ago now. And uh, Ricky was one of my Bible teachers. So if you have time to say hello to them, uh, please say hello to them. They're great. But welcome to everyone. It is a blessing to be able to fellowship together here um, this morning. Uh, before we start, uh, I just want to remind everyone how good God is. Is God good? All the time, right? Let's say it. Let's say it. God is good? And all the time? Amen. Amen. Uh, I think you might have already seen our sermon title for this morning. Our sermon title, our Bible study for this morning, is entitled Pandesal and Tilapia. Um, for those that aren't Filipino, or maybe you are Fili uh yeah, excuse me, let me rephrase that. For those of you that aren't Filipino, and specifically if you are Filipino, but maybe you don't know what those are, I'm going to explain what pandesal and tilapia are very shortly. So, you, so don't you worry, don't you worry. Um, I want to tell a story, and then we'll say a word of prayer, and then we'll go to our first scripture for this morning, our main passage of scripture. Let's actually start right now. Let's go to John chapter 6. Let's go to John chapter 6, so we're already good to go when we start reading our passage of scripture for this morning. We're going to be based in John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. We are going to study a fairly famous story in scripture, one that you may be familiar with. And if you're not, that's good too. If it's your first time reading this story, praise the Lord. We'll be reading it together. So John chapter 6, verse 1. But before we look at this passage of Scripture, before we read this story, um, an illustration, talking about now pandesal and tilapia. Uh, does anyone not know what pandesal and tilapia are? By raise of hand, does anyone not know what that is? And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. That's okay. I think most of us do. Just in case someone here or someone online doesn't know what those two things are, pandesal is a, uh, a bread. It's a very delicious type of bread. Um, specifically, I think, made and found in the Philippines, but also can be found and bought at Filipino stores across the country. Um, I don't really know how to describe it other than it being kind of like a dinner roll. It's kind of like a dinner roll, but better, way better. <laughs> um, and tilapia, for those that don't know what a tilapia is, it's a fish. It's a, uh, a, a fish with a, a, a white fish, I think is what they would say it is. Um, has like a, fla a flaky and a very neutral flavor. Uh, it's a clean fish. Uh, Levit uh, Leviticus 11, excuse me, says that a clean fish has scales and fins, and it's, uh, tilapia is one of those types of fish. It's a clean fish that has scales, that has fins. It's a staple in the Filipino diet. Um, when I visited the Philippines now 15 years ago, I've only been to the Philippines one time. 
I went to uh, Ilocos Norte, in the north, in the north part of the Philippines where my dad's family lived. We would eat tilapia every single day. Every single day, that was the main thing. Tilapia and rice, of course, rice with everything. Um, and I also grew up eating tilapia just as a, a Filipino-American in the United States. Uh, one thing that was a, a consistent pattern, at least for me, when I was growing up, whenever my mom would bring pandesal or cook tilapia, I would always request and even demand as a child that I have my own. So when, when my mom bought, bought pandesal from the Filipino store, I need to have my own bag. Just my own bag. And they usually come in six, right? Six or if they're freshly baked, maybe six or seven or eight, whatever the case is. But I would have my own. And I would eat my own pandesal bag. I wouldn't share it with anyone else. I wasn't a sharing kind of person, I guess, when I was younger. I would share with you now, of course. But as a kid, it was just my own. When, when my mom would cook tilapia, um, I would need to have my own tilapia. Because tilapia are not too big, right? They're not super huge. So I would have my own tilapia that I would share with no one else. That was kind of my disposition and, and, and how I grew up. I had my own, my own fish, my own bread, and, and, and I wouldn't share with anyone else. This morning, we're going to talk about a person, specifically a young person, a boy, that was willing to share. And we're going to draw some lessons from that. Hopefully that can be applicable to our day-to-day -day lives as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. So before we start reading scripture and diving into our story for this morning, let's go ahead and say one more word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we study the Bible, we ask for your spirit once again to lead us and to guide us into all truth. I pray that you would speak personally to every single person here, that you would speak to their hearts. That's the miracle of preaching. That's the miracle of you working through preaching is that you can speak to each of us individually and uniquely. So I pray that you would do that for every single person here in person and every single person online, that what we study today would not be wisdom that comes from myself or from a man, but it would be wisdom that comes from above. And as we talk about pandesal and tilapia, about fishes uh, and loaves, we ask for a fresh baked bread uh, that comes from heaven, a loaf, a slice, uh, the bread of life, Lord. That's what we're asking for this morning. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone. Let's turn to John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. So everyone, please turn to your Bibles. Young people, children, please turn to your Bibles. If it's on your phone, that's great. If you have a physical Bible, that's great. Let's all turn to John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. What book? John, what chapter? And what verse are we starting in? Wow, verse 1. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. On the screen, you can also see the verses in the New King James Version. Starting in John chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Verse 2. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs which he had performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. So in these first three verses, uh, we are being introduced to Jesus. We are being introduced to a multitude that is following him. We are given, given context for what is to follow. So there's Jesus. He's traveling. There's a great multitude that's following him because of the signs that he has been performing and more specifically, the healing that he has been doing. He's been healing people of all sorts of diseases, uh, working miracles, and people are taking notice and are following Jesus. Multitudes and multitudes. That, what, that, that is what we see in the first three verses of John chapter 6. Now let's go to verse 4. Now the Passover, a feast for the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, who is one of his disciples, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Verse 6, but this Jesus said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them might have a little. Verse 8, 
One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was as much grass in the excuse me, now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks and distributed them to the disciples, and to the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise the fish as much as they had wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So we've read the entire story that we'll be looking at this morning. Are you familiar with this story? I think most of us are familiar with this story. If it's the first time you're reading it, that's a blessing as well. This story is pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. So Jesus had been traveling. A multitude had been following him. And now it had come to a point in time where this multitude had gotten hungry. And Jesus was asking specifically Philip and his disciples, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed all of these people? Now, let's go back. I want us to go back to verse 4. Let's go back to verse 4. Now that we've read the whole story, let's pick out certain parts and bring out principles from this story specifically. Let's go to John chapter 6, starting again in verse 4. Jesus does something really interesting here. Now the Passover, a feast for the Jews, was near, verse 5. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? So a simple question addressed to one of his disciples, Philip specifically. Philip, what are we going to do to feed all these people? And later on in the story, we find out how many people are actually here. How many people are here? How many men specifically? You guys remember what we read? It was a little bit farther down. It's 5,000. Now, in the book Desire of Ages, and if you're not familiar with the book Desire of Ages, it's a book written by Ellen White on the life of Jesus. She lets us know that that number 5,000 only accounts for the men, not the women or the children. So there are probably, not even probably, there are definitely more than 5,000 people there, but it, it's probably even double that amount. Not just 5,000, maybe even 10,000. If you think of all the kids and if you think of all the women that are there, the, hus the, the, the wives, the sisters, the aunties, they're all there. There are definitely more than 5,000 people, but we're only uh, counted 5,000 men specifically. So Jesus turns to Philip and says, hey, how are we going to feed all of these people? And very interestingly enough, in verse 6, we are told what Jesus is thinking or planning already. It says in verse 6, but Jesus said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. So did Jesus know what he was going to do, yes or no? Yeah, Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew what he was going to do to feed the people and to address the problem of their hunger. But he wanted to test Philip. He wanted to see where Philip was at in his faith. So he asked Philip, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed all of these people? And what was Philip's answer? Philip's answer is found in verse 7. It's a very logical answer. It's a very, I, I think, uh, sensible answer. He starts talking about money and how much money they have and how much money it would even cost to feed all these people. Let's look at verse 7 again. Philip answered Jesus. The question is, Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? He answered Jesus and, and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. So Philip is very practical. He's very sensible. He's saying, even with this amount of money, we wouldn't be able to feed all these people, even if it was just a little bit. But in verse 8, something interesting happens. Verse 8, one of his disciples, so another disciple, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, there is a lad, a boy, here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? We're not going to talk about this right now, but Andrew has a very interesting um, character. He brings people to Jesus often. He brings people to Jesus. And in this case, he's bringing a boy that has five barley loaves and two small fish. And uh, he, it's, it's, it's kind of like he's doing what he can do. He's bringing this boy with this little lunch, but there's still some doubt there. You know, 
uh, there's this boy with five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? So there is a, uh, an action of faith, but also still doubt we're seeing in Andrew. And you could extrapolate and say in all the disciples. Now, let's put this on pause. I'm going to talk about something that you may be familiar with or at least heard of before. Are you familiar with the bystander effect? Has anyone ever heard of that before? The bystander effect. Um, it, it can go by another name. Uh, uh, sometimes psychologists and, and social scientists call the bystander effect uh, a diffusion of responsibility. A diffusion of responsibility. I'm going to give you two examples of this, okay? Um, I don't know if you've ever texted out in a group before. Maybe um, uh, the younger people can resonate with this more. But what I noticed is whenever I text in a group message, especially as the group message gets larger and larger, there is a lower and lower likelihood that people are going to respond to me in that group message. So if it's me texting one person, let's say my wife, well, obviously there's only one person that could respond, right? But if you're texting a larger group, let's say a group message of five or a group message of 10, do you know what those people in the group message could think when they receive a text from you? They'll think maybe someone else will respond. Have you ever experienced that before? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I've noticed that before. So that's one example, just in day-to-day -day life. There's a very, very famous example of, of and, and, and this is kind of a, uh, it's, it's, it's not a good story. It's one that involves crime. It's one that specifically involves the murder of an individual. And basically, there was a person that was being attacked, and there were many bystanders around. And even though the person was being attacked in public, even though the person was being attacked, uh, and many other people were, were, were available and could have helped, no one did because of the bystander effect. They thought someone else is going to take care of this. Someone else is going, someone else is more qualified. Someone else can be better to deal with this. Or maybe even just someone else, not myself. There are so many people here. They'll deal with the situation. It ended up no one did help the person. And unfortunately, that individual died. This is the bystander effect. My suggestion, I'm going to suggest to you this morning that sometimes this same principle, this same effect, the, this diffusion of responsibility can happen in our own Christian experience. I'm going to read to you a couple of different quotes from, again, the book Desire of Ages. And if you've never read that book, it's a great book. It has a lot of uh, uh, intimate details on the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read you a couple of different quotes from the Desire of Ages as we begin to wrap up our Bible study for this morning. But I do want to call your attention to one last place in this story. Let's go to verse 10. Let's go to verse 10 specifically. So John chapter 6, looking at verse 10. Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. So this is right after Andrew brought the young boy with the five barley loaves and the two fishes. Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so there was, there was area to sit down. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. We talked about that. 5,000 men, not including women and children. Verse 11, and Jesus took the loaves which he had given thanks, he excuse me, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise the fish as much as they had wanted. There's a specific detail here that we can miss out on that is really, that is vitally important to our study this morning. So Jesus he, he got the fishes and the loaves from the young lad, and he, he prayed over the food. He blessed the food, and then he started to distribute the food. But my question is, according to the passage that we just read, who did Jesus distribute the food to? To the disciples. Do, do, you, do you see that? Jesus distributed the food to the disciples, and then the, the disciples distributed the food to whom? To the people. So there was a step-by-step -step process here. Jesus got the food from the lad. Jesus blessed the food and then gave it to the disciples. And then the disciples gave it to, to the people. Now, I'm going to read you this quote from The Desire of Ages. This is page 369. And it gives us a little bit more detail on what's happening here. And this is very important for our study this morning. So the quote reads, In full reliance upon God, Jesus took the small store of loaves. And, all there, and although there was but a small portion of for his own family of disciples, he did not invite them to eat, but began to distribute them, bidding them serve the people. 
So even though there was such a small amount of food, he didn't give it to his disciples first to eat for themselves. I don't know if you've ever felt this way before, but whenever there's potluck, um, this was more in the past, uh, but whenever there was potluck, I would always try to be the first person in line. I want to be the first person in line, get my food quickly, serve myself first. Um, I don't do that anymore now. I let everyone else eat first, especially, you know, our young people and, and, and those that are a little bit older. They can go first. Uh, but there's always this desire, I think this intrinsic desire in human nature to address our own, our own needs first. But in this case, that's not happening. Jesus gives to his disciples, not for themselves, but to give to others. So now let's continue the quote. So he did not invite them to eat, but began to distribute the, the, the fish and the bread to his disciples, bidding them to serve the people. Now listen to this part. This is the most important part for today's study. Listen to this. The food multiplied in Jesus' hands. That we expect. The food was multiplying in the hands of Jesus. He's God. Fully God and fully human. He's working a miracle. And the hands of the disciples, the food also multiplied. Let me read that again. The food multiplied in his hands and also in the hands of the disciples reaching out to Christ himself, the bread of life, were never empty. So what is being said here in this specific quote that the food itself was not just being multiplied in Jesus' hands, the food was also being multiplied in, 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 in whose other hands? In the disciples. Wouldn't that be cool if you were just ripping apart tilapia and pandasol and then it just kept on multiplying? That would be awesome. Now, it wasn't multiplying for themselves. It was multiplying for everyone else. And then at the end of the day, everyone was full. Everyone was fed. And we see specifically in the last part of this story, in verse 13 specifically, that when they gathered up all the fragments, there was a certain number of, of baskets of food remaining. Does anyone remember how many baskets? 12. Was it 12, Ryan? You remember, yeah? It was 12 for Baon, right? For those who don't know what Baon is, that's to take for lunch. So there were 12 baskets of food remaining, one for each disciple. Uh, and not specifically for them to take for Baon, it was for other people, but I believe a rebuke to them to show them that they had been with Jesus, so they didn't need to worry about the food. They didn't need to worry about where it was going to come from. Now, if you read the context for this story, miracles had already taken place before this, and the disciples had been present for those miracles, the water turning into wine, Jesus healing uh, at the, the pool of Bethesda, uh, Jesus healing a nobleman's son, even though the nobleman's son wasn't there. Philip and Andrew and the rest of the disciples were present to see and to witness all of these different miracles. But even in this moment, when Jesus asked them, hey, are, how are we going to feed all these people? They weren't thinking about who was with them. They were just thinking about all the other logistics that went involved. Does that make sense? So now let's go to our closing verses. Let's go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, as we start to wrap this up. Luke chapter 6. Luke, the sixth chapter. Luke chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 38. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. So I'm going to read another quote from the Desire of Ages before we read this quote. So listen closely. Listen closely to this quote from the book Desire of Ages, specifically on this story again. The disciples were the channel of communication between Christ and the people. This should be a great encouragement to his disciples today, you and me. Christ is the great center, the source of all strength. His disciples are to receive their supplies from him. The most intelligent, the most spiritually minded can only bestow as they receive. Of themselves, they can supply nothing for the needs of the soul. We can impart only that which we receive from Christ, and we can receive only as we impart to others. As we continue imparting or giving, we continue to receive, and the more we impart, the more we shall receive. Thus, we may constantly believing, trusting, and be receiving and also imparting. So there's a lot of words there, but what's being said here is summarized in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. So let's read that. Luke chapter 6, and specifically we're going to look at verse 38. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. 
give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Let's focus on the first part of that verse. It says, give, and it will be given unto you. Give, and it will be given unto you. We can only give as we receive ourselves. But the part that I want us to focus on here is the, the, the part of giving, the part of actually making ourselves available. Many of us, and this is what I want to talk about the most this morning. This, if you're going to remember anything from today's Bible study, please remember this. We are in a very transitory period as a church. Is that true? We're, we're, next week is going to be our last week in this facility, in this building. And we've already identified that the church is not the building. Amen? Just because the church is the, the building is different doesn't mean the church has disappeared, right? We will always exist as a Las Vegas Philan family, no matter what facility that we're in. But in spite of the struggles that we're going through, the challenges, I should say, we've been through COVID, and now we're going through a transition in where we're going to worship. We need to focus on one thing and, and one thing alone, and that is how we can continue to reach out to other people. I was talking with Charm. Um, this past week, and she had a Bible study, a Bible study with a couple that had been passed to her by Sebastian. And uh, a neighbor had decided to join on that Bible study. Uh, and, and she was excited for that, but she was also a little bit concerned because uh, the Bible study was getting bigger, and she wanted that, that, that guest, that person who joined in, to be able to have their own set of Bible studies to start from the beginning because a lot of their questions had to do with stuff that had already been covered. Because the studies she was having were already kind of in the middle of the set. Uh, so she was asking me, Pastor Joe, do you know of anyone else that could give Bible studies to this person? And we thought of a couple different people. But then I also started thinking, you know, I, 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 I'm going to pray that more, more people would be available to give Bible studies. Not just the ones that have already been doing them, like Auntie Edie or Elder JL, um, Renji. Is there, uh, are there other people that are willing to give Bible studies? And many times Jesus asks us a question the same way he asked Philip. He, he, asked us a he asked Philip the question, how are we going to feed all these people? And you know what the first thing we think of is? We think of all the different things that are limiting us. We think of all the logistics. We think of how money or ability or time or whatever the case is, is limiting us. Did you know that Jesus is asking us a very similar question this morning? He's not asking us, how are we going to literally feed people? He's asking us, how are we going to spiritually feed people? He's asking you to do evangelism, to feed people spiritually on his behalf. Now, he's going to give you the fishes and the loaves, but it's your job to give those to other people. But just like Philip, we think to ourselves of all the different problems, of all the different challenges, instead of realizing that we have the God of the universe with us. They had Jesus with them. Jesus who had turned water to, into wine. Jesus who had healed multiple sicknesses that could not be healed by anyone else. But the first thing Philip thought of was, well, we don't have enough money. What is money to the God of the universe but paper and metal, right? So you may be thinking to yourself, well, if someone asks me to give a Bible study to somebody else, I can't do that. I don't know anything about the Bible. I don't know anything about Scripture. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a good teacher. You're doing exactly what Philip did. We only have 200 denarii. How are we going to feed all these people? Let me tell you this. Remember this phrase. If you, it, if you can remember this, then you will get the nugget and the nucleus of our Bible study this morning. God is not looking for your ability. God is not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. Does that make sense? He's not looking for your skill and your talent and, and the, the different gifts that you have. And all of those are God-given. Don't get me wrong. But there are a lot of skilled and talented people in the church that do not make themselves available. That do not make themselves available to God. You know the little boy? The little boy that gave the, the, uh, the five pandasol and the two tilapia? Did he have to do that? Yes or no? No, he could have said, these are my... These, these are my tilapia and pandasol, just like when I was a kid. These are mine. I'm not giving them to anybody else. But what did he decide to do? Did he decide to give, okay, I'm going to give Jesus three of the pandasol, so then I can have two of them. And since there's two fish, I'm going to give one to Jesus and one. What did he do? He gave it what? 
He gave all of it to Jesus. And was that boy still able to eat, yes or no? Yeah, he was part of that crowd. So he was able to eat more, probably more than he would have been able to if he didn't give the fishes and the loaves to Jesus. Sometimes we hold ourselves back in the service of the Lord because we think, I don't have enough to give. I only have this much time. I only have this much, much energy. I only have this much talent. So let me, let me just give God this little bit and keep the rest for myself. Brothers and sisters, that's not how the gospel works. That's not how God works. When we give ourselves to him fully, when we trust him and make ourselves fully available, we will have more at the end of the day than we would have had before. Does that make sense? God will bless us even more abundantly. If we withhold, we're actually doing a disservice for ourselves. So what I'm asking you is this, as a church family. I know we're going through a lot. I know we're going through a transition, and I know there are many different reasons why we logistically or logically shouldn't do evangelism. One of those could be even COVID, the pandemic. Have you guys heard of the Delta variant? Things are starting to heat up again. But I'm going to let you know this. The world is not getting better. Can you see that? Things are not getting better. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't be careful and we shouldn't be cautious and we shouldn't be mindful. But what is happening in the world shouldn't prevent us from doing our job as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Just because we don't have a church to worship in shouldn't prevent us from doing evangelism with our friends, with our families, with our classmates, with our community. So my appeal for you this morning is very, very simple. God is calling you to give to him your pandesal and your tilapia, whatever that is. He's asking you to give it to him so that he can use it in his service. What I'm asking you specifically is I need more people that are willing to give Bible studies. I need more people that are willing to go out and door knock and do surveys. We need more people to help out in all the different parts of our church service. And some of you may be hearing that and thinking, wow, that's scary. Wow, I I don't know if I can do that. Remember, it's not about your ability. It's about your availability. When I was talking with Charm, she told me, you know, I really... I don't know how to, I, I, don't know, I really don't know that much about, about, about the Bible. But something happens every time I give this Bible study. God just comes through. And, and at the end of it, I, I, I can't believe some of the things that I said. I can't believe some of the things that I taught. And I know that it must be God. And I told her what I'm telling you. You know what? I'm really happy to hear that. Because it's not about you. It's, Charm, it's not about anything that, 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 that you have or don't have. You did the most important thing. You just made yourself available. You make yourself available to God. Let me read you one more quote. One more quote from The Desire of Ages. This one is great. This is one of my favorites. When the question comes home to your heart, where shall we buy bread that these may, he- these may eat? Let not your answer be the response of unbelief. When the disciples heard the Savior's direction, give ye them to eat, all the difficulties arose in their minds. They questioned, Shall we go away into the villages to buy food? So now when the people are destitute of the bread of life, the Lord's children question, shall we send for someone afar to come and feed them? But what said Christ? Make the men sit down and he fed them there. So when you are surrounded by souls in need, know that Christ is there. Commune with him. Bring your barley and loaves to Jesus. What is being said here? Are there people around us in our day-to-day life that need Jesus? Yes or no? Can you think of someone in your workplace? Can you think of somewhere in your classroom? Can you think of someone in your family that needs Jesus? Yes or no? There are souls around us that need help. But sometimes we think of all the difficulties ahead of us in evangelism instead of thinking about what God can do for us. Well, if I talk to this person about God, it's going to be awkward. Well, if I I say this, this thing about Jesus, what will they think of me? Oh, but... If, 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 I say, if, if I mention church or if I mention God, it'll, it'll be uncomfortable. We think of all the different difficulties. We think of all the different challenges instead of thinking we have the God of the universe on our side. Where there is no defeat, there is only victory. Let's go to our final Bible verse for this morning. Philippians chapter 4. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Does anyone know who Stephen Curry is? Does anyone know who that is? Yeah, the famous basketball player. My friend Ricky, his, his, uh, his favorite basketball team is the Golden State Warriors. They didn't do so well. Well, they did okay this past season. 
Hopefully they'll do better this coming season. This is actually Stephen Curry's favorite verse. It's a verse that a lot of people know, but I think it's a verse that has kind of lost its power. It's lost its meaning because we see it so often and we read it so often. He actually, Stephen Curry actually puts this on his shoe. I can do all things. Let's read Philippians chapter 4, reading verse 13. What verse? I want you to see this verse. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many things can you do through Christ? All things. Who strengthens us? Christ. Is this a, is this a great verse? Yes or no? Hey, is there a Seventh-day Adventist in this church? When I read this verse, you know what I see? I see a blank check. If someone gave you a blank check, a rich person, let's say Jeff Bezos, right? Jeff Bezos gave you a blank check and said, here, you can write whatever amount you want. I'll give it to you. How would you feel? I'd be like, I'm going to buy us a church. This is great. Oh, I, I, that would be amazing. I could do so much with a blank check from Jeff Bezos. Did you know you have a blank check from the king of the universe? You have a blank check. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Do you really believe that? It, it's easy to say, right? It's easy to say, but it's hard to do. When I see our church, I don't see a pastor and elders and church members and us having, you know, like the pastor and the elders do the, the, the work. The treasurer does the, the, the work, and, and, and that's all. You know what I see when I see all of you? I see a group of pastors. Everyone here can be a pastor. Everyone here can be a minister for God. Do you believe that? And everyone needs to be a minister for God. Some people think if I just give money to the church, then that's fine. And I'm not saying don't give your tithe and offering to the church, but that's not enough. That's not enough. And just say, I'm going to give the money to the church and let someone else take care of the evangelism. Let, let the young people take care of the evangelism. Let the, the, the elders take care of the evangelism. Let the pastor take care of the evangelism. That's not how Christianity works. All of us need to take part in active and aggressive evangelism if Jesus is going to come again. Do you want Jesus to come again? Ellen White says in the Spirit of Prophecy that the pastors and the preachers, they're not going to finish the work. Do you know who she says is going to finish the work? You! <laughs> it's going to be you and specifically the young people. Looking at you guys. Yeah. Our head, uh, our head elder is pretty young, you know, and his wife too and Mary. The, the young people, but not just the young. It's going to be everybody. But the next time God asks you to do something that makes you a little bit uncomfortable, all right? The next time the pastor asks you to do something that makes you a little bit uncomfortable, hey, can you come to this Bible study with me? Hey, can you do this part for church? I pray and I hope that the first things that don't pop up in your mind are all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. I pray that what comes into your mind are all the reasons why you should do it. And more specifically, this verse right here. Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do how many things through Christ? Does that include Bible studies? Does that include door knocking? Ooh, door knocking, scary. <laughs> Does that include any ministry that, we, that you can be a part of? VBS, uh, the, 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 the health ministries, the greeting ministries. It could be anything. I'm going to end with this story. And I went a, bit, a, a little bit longer. I hope that's okay. I'm going to end with this story. Uh, someone really special here today. This, uh, this is uh, Ate Reggie. Hello, Ate Reggie. Does everyone know Ate Reggie? She used to be my Sabbath school teacher, all right? She was my Sabbath school teacher when I was like 13 or 14 years old, her and her sister. Um, and the cool thing is, uh, specifically, um, uh, there are three people with us in Youth Rush that are doing canvassing, right? Uh, Jer um, Jericho, uh, Ming Ming, and uh, Hannah. Um, and I, I never, like, it's so cool to, to see them go from week one to where, they're, where, to where they are right now. They're really shy kids, you know, they're really shy kids, but you should see them. You should see them and how they're ministering to other people. It's amazing. Um, I think Ate Reggie would, would tell you, uh, <laughs> uh, I wasn't the, uh, the, the most, um, I was kind of rebellious, a little, a little bit rebellious and kind of mischievous. Uh, and if you were to tell me one day you're going to be a pastor, I would have been like, <laughs> no way. <laughs> I, uh, I'll be the president of the United States before I'm a pastor. 
And, and that wasn't just because of the job. I just wasn't that kind of person. I didn't talk up front. I, I didn't like being in front of people. I didn't like saying, and this, <laughs> this would be foreign to me years ago. But because of Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do what I do. Not because of my own strength, but because of what God gives me. I can do all things through Christ. So what am I trying to tell you? I was the, when I was 13 years old, I was the, the furthest away from God that you could get as a young person. The furthest. And if you were to tell me that I'd be doing the things that I was doing today, I, would, I wouldn't believe it. What am I telling you? No matter who you think you are, no matter what abilities you think you have or don't have, God can use you. God can use you to do powerful things. God can use you to bring other people to heaven. Look how he's using Ryan. What? Ryan, he's, he's, he's been part of our church family for just a few months, and he's already doing so much in the church and for the church. Same thing with Lexia. If you were here this morning for Sabbath school, you would have heard her beautiful prayer. Ryan, you're, you're going to preach pretty soon, okay? You got to get ready for it, all right? But I'm not even talking to just the young people. I know some of you, are, some, some of you guys can really preach. Ate Christi. Ate Christi can talk. But not just talk, she can preach. She can preach the word. I see her up here for Sabbath school preaching to me. And I'm like, this is great. Uh, Auntie Ivy. Auntie I is Auntie Ivy here? Is she here? Oh, she, she, she left for a little bit. She can preach the word. I'm looking at all these, all you, Elder JL preaches. Renji, you can preach. So many of you can, can, oh, Auntie Arabelle, you can really preach. You can really, really preach. Amen. And I'm not just talking about preaching. There are so many people here that if you gave a Bible study, I'm sure it would be powerful, not because of anything within yourself, but because you're making yourself available for God. What am I appealing to you this morning? If I can do it, and most of you just know me just a little bit, but if you could have just seen me when, when, when Ate Reggie saw me, if you could have just seen me five, six, ten years ago, you would never think that's going to be the pastor of the Phil Am Church. Never. But look where I am. Praise the Lord. If I can be here, you can do powerful things for God. If he can use the, 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 the little boy who didn't want to share his pandasol and tilapia, he can use you. So what I'm asking you is, as we transition to our new church, I need your help. God needs your help. This church can grow bigger and bigger, not for the sake of growing necessarily, but for the sake of growing God's kingdom. And if you want to be a part of that, please talk to Elder Gary. Please talk to Elder JL. Please talk to myself. We need more people that are willing to give Bible studies, that are willing to go out there and do literature evangelism, that are willing to do health evangelism, that are willing to work with our church to do so many different things. If every single one of us would just bring one person to Christ this next year, into, next, in, into 2022, what would happen to our church? It would double. Do you want to see our church double? That would be pretty awesome, right? But more than that, I know God is setting us up for something really special. Do you believe that we're going to be able to buy our own church? I believe that too. But that's only going to happen. And even if we do buy a nice big church, what does it mean if we don't fill it up with people? Nothing. Doesn't mean anything. So it's not even about buying a big church. I believe that if we prepare ourselves as if we already have a big church, right, and we need to fill that church, God will bless us, just like he did with the fishes and loaves. Humans, we're about addition, right? God's about multiplication. If it's your desire to work for God, then please come talk to me. Talk to Elder JL. Talk to Elder Gary. Please present to us, and more importantly, present to God your tilapia and your pandasol. If that's your desire, please stand with us as we sing our closing song for this morning, Bringing in the Sheaves. Bringing in the Sheaves.
Heavenly Father, our prayer is simple, but it's a prayer that has a lot involved with it. My prayer, and I believe our prayer, is to be those workers that will help you bring in the sheaves. And whatever that means for us personally, in our workplace, or in our families, maybe even at school, I pray that you would give us the strength, the power, the wisdom to be able to do just that, to bring in more sheaves, to bring in more souls, to bring in more people to this church, but most importantly, to bring more people to heaven. I pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Just a few announcements uh, before I invite Elder Raul up here to um, go through our dismissal procedure, our exit procedure. Uh, two announcements. The first is, and I'm just going to read this straight. Uh, this is from Elder Raul about Pathfinders. Uh, Pathfinders, a Google Classroom invitation has been sent out to you uh, to enroll and complete the first honors. That is the uh, Aboriginal lore honor. That sounds fun. If you, do not, uh, if you have not received the invitation, uh, get in contact with the Pathfinder director, Elder Raul, for the invitation link. And then the second announcement is actually about a birthday coming up. We are celebrating the 12th birthday of Charles. Amen. Amen. On August 8th, 11 a.m., he's inviting the church family to uh, attend a pool party. If you are able to attend, please RSVP. I'm going to send out that invitation and the code to the, for, to the church family. So please uh, come to that if you are available. We were actually at the Hernandez's last week, or this, this, uh, this Sunday, right? Was it this past Sunday? Yeah, it was this past Sunday, and it was great. It was a fun time. So uh, please fellowship with us, not just on Saturdays, but during all these other fun events and celebrations. Apart from that, Elder Raul, he will give us our exit.